Oxford Bookworms, Stage Two. The Death of Karen Silkwood, by Joyce Hannam. Chapter Four. The Shower. But in the summer of 1974, everything began to change. One evening, Karen and Susan were leaving the laboratory. First, Karen checked her hands in front of the scanner, and then a minute later, Susan checked her hands. Suddenly, there was a terrible noise. It was like a high scream. Everybody could hear it all over the factory. Susan didn't move; she just looked at her hands. Then the door of the laboratory flew open. Two men in white coats ran in and took Susan by the arms. Before Karen could do anything, they pulled Susan through the door. The terrible noise of the alarm was still going. Karen shouted, "Where are you taking her?" Nobody could hear. Nobody answered. Suddenly, the noise stopped. Karen turned to the other workers. Where will she be? In the shower room. Karen ran out of the laboratory and along the corridor to the shower room. Inside the room, Susan was screaming. Karen pushed open the door. Susan had no clothes on. And the two men were showering her from head to foot, in her eyes, inside her ears, everywhere. The water hit her body like stones. Stop that! Shouted Karen. You're hurting her. Not as much as radioactive dust can hurt her. One very small piece could kill her. Shouted back one of the men. Ten minutes later, they stopped the shower. Susan's face was as white as snow, and she was shaking with cold. The men checked her body again with a hand scanner. Okay, you're clean now. Put your clothes on. In five minutes, we'll come back and take you to the medical center for more tests. They left. Susan looked at Karen. They say I'm clean, outside perhaps, but what about outside? How much radioactive dust is in my body? Am I hot? Her voice was quiet and tired. Suddenly, she looked old. Slowly. She began to put her clothes on. Hot? What do you mean? Asked Karen. Hot means radioactive. I see. Karen looked at her own hands. Were they clean? How carefully did the scanner check them? She worked next to Susan in the laboratory. Perhaps the dust was on her hands too. I'm sure you're fine, Susan. The men said you were okay, and the doctors will know. Nobody knows. Uranium is very new. Nobody really knows what it can do to us. One of the men came back with a woman. Come along, dear. Time for your medical tests. Then they saw Karen near the door. What are you doing here? If you finished work for today, you can go home. Karen did not listen to them. Are you okay, Susan? Do you want me to come with you? Susan shook her head. No, it's okay. You go home, Karen. I'll phone you later. Don't worry about me. And thank you. 
The man and the woman took Susan's arms and walked down the corridor, with Susan between them. She looked very small and very afraid. Chapter 5 The New Union Official After the shower, Susan was a different person. She was quiet and didn't laugh very often. One evening, a few months after the shower, Karen met Susan in a bar for a drink after work. You know, Karen, we really must leave the factory. It's very dangerous. How many times do we hear the alarm now? More and more often. And every time we hear it, we know that someone is in danger. How does it happen? I don't understand it, said Karen. It's because the factory is working 24 hours a day. The safety people can't do their job well. They have to check everything carefully every day. But when can they do it? When we finish, there are the people who come in to work at night. The managers don't care about the danger. They only care about the money. And you know, Karen, I am just the same. I also have to think only of money. I have three children, and my husband is dead. I need the money from the factory. It's more than I can get from any other job in Oklahoma. Three children are expensive. Very expensive. Of course, answered Karen. I understand. Drew and I have talked about this. He's thinking about leaving, too. It's okay for a young man, strong like Drew. He can get many other jobs. You could leave, too, Karen. Why don't you? Because I've decided to change things here. I like the job, and I like the people who work here. The money is good. We just need to improve safety. That's all. Surely that's not difficult. We have to talk to the managers and tell them it's important. Do you know Bob in Laboratory 16? Well, don't laugh. But he's asked me to be on the union committee, and I'm going to try it. But Karen... You can't. You're a woman. There are no women on the committee. The men won't vote for you, said Susan. Perhaps not, replied Karen. But what about you? Will you vote for me? Do you know how many women work for this factory? Hundreds. And why won't the men vote for me? Perhaps I'm the first woman who has asked for their vote. Susan smiled. Well... But she couldn't find a good answer to Karen's question. A week later, when the workers had to vote for the new committee, most of the women voted for Karen, and a lot of the men voted for her, too. They saw that she really wanted to change things at the factory, and everyone agreed with her that safety was very important. So Karen was now an official on the factory's union committee. Chapter 6 The Meeting in Washington A month or two later, the alarm sounded again. This time, Karen was in front of the scanner. She went quietly with the men in white coats. But after her shower, she asked them a lot of questions about safety in the factory. They didn't answer any questions. They just got angry. They knew she was on the union committee, and they were afraid of her. 
All the managers knew that Karen was on the committee because she always had a notebook in her hand. In her notebook, she wrote down all the scanner alarms, every shower, and every other danger in the factory. She asked a lot of people a lot of questions, and always the answers in her notebook. The notebook was getting full. In September 1974, the Union Committee had a meeting. Everybody could see that safety at the factory was getting worse. The committee decided to write to the Union leaders in Washington and ask for help. Two days later, there was a phone call from Washington. The leaders wanted to see the Union Committee immediately in Washington. For Karen, this journey to Washington was a big adventure. She wanted to see the White House and all the other famous places in the first city of the USA, but she had very little free time. She spent nearly all the time at a long meeting. At first, the leaders just listened to what Karen and the others said about the factory. Their faces got more and more unhappy. Karen explained what was happening. The managers take photographs of the fuel rods to check that they are safe, but I know that they are secretly changing the negatives of the photographs. And why are they doing that? Because the photographs show that the rods are not safe. Suddenly, one of the leaders said to Karen, Do you understand what you're saying, Miss Silkwood? The lives of many people could be in danger if you're right. Uranium is very, very dangerous. I'm just telling you what the people in the photographic laboratory have told me, Karen said. If this is true... The government will close your factory. Do you understand what that means? A lot of people will lose their jobs. The story will be on the front page of every newspaper. Karen looked unhappy. Will it? We only want the managers to change a few things and to be more careful about safety. I think it's already too late for that. After the meeting, one of the leaders stopped Karen outside in the corridor. Just come with me for a minute, please, he said. He took Karen into a small room and closed the door. He didn't want anybody to hear them. Karen, we need proof about these negatives. Without proof, nobody will believe our story. Can you get some for us? What proof do you need? Someone will have to go into the photographic laboratory and steal some negatives. We need the negatives both before they change them and after they change them. Do you know where they keep the negatives? Yes. I know, said Karen quietly, but it will be very difficult. I don't work in the photographic laboratory. If one of the managers sees me there, how can I explain what I'm doing? I don't know, but you'll have to think of something. We can't help you if you haven't any proof. They were both silent for a minute. Karen looked out of the window. It was a lovely evening. She thought of Mr. Bailey's cold smile and Susan's screams in the shower. I'll do it, she said. Good girl. It will be very dangerous. Nobody must know what you're doing. Not your friends on the committee. Nobody. I'll be the only person who knows. 
I'll phone you once a week, and you can tell me how you're getting on. Nobody. Can't I tell my boyfriend, Drew? asked Karen. No. It could be dangerous for anybody who knows. I see. Okay. I'll do what I can, said Karen slowly. Be very, very careful. You're a brave girl. I'd like to thank you for agreeing to do this. Karen stood up. Outside the window, the sun was still shining, but she felt cold and lonely. Can I phone you if I need to speak to someone? Of course. Any time, day or night. This is my card with my name and phone number. Karen took his card. She saw that his name was Pete. She looked at him once more, and then she left the room. <laughs>